Well, hey, we are five weeks away from Easter 2016. I'm incredibly excited. We have such a cool, cool next five weeks together where we are going to do something called the journey to Golgotha or the road to Golgotha. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this journey together and we're going to look at every element leading up from the Lord's Supper all the way to the point when Jesus was hung on the cross to the point where he rose again. And each time that we do one of these elements, our goal is to kind of take you and put you right in the middle of what was going on. You know, so many times we have these, uh, we have these services where we kind of talk about what happened and we can kind of glaze over it and kind of miss what Christ was actually doing in the moment. But everything was for an extreme, um, in t- extremely intentional purpose. And what I want to do is I want to put you right in the middle of this extremely intentional purpose. So for the next week, we're going to take Lord's Supper today just like they took it back then. I'm going to explain to you Passover. We're going to look at the personalities that sat at the table that day, what they talked about, what they were thinking, what emotions they were feeling. We're going to look at what it was like to be Simon who was on the road to Golgotha that had just got grabbed at random and was given Jesus' cross and made to carry it. We're going to look at what it was like to be Peter to deny Christ. We're going to look at what it was like to be Mary. I'm so excited about that week. That's going to be really cool. We're going to do, I'll give you a little bit of insight on that week. That week, we're going to take five women that are mothers, one that um, has adopted a child because Jesus was kind of like Mary's adopted son. He was born from a virgin birth. We're going to look at, um, we're going to have a mom who's lost a child. We're going to have a mom who has watched her child be bullied. We're going to watch, we're going to talk to a mom who's watched her kid get sick and couldn't do anything about it. And we're going to let them explain those emotions as a mom that they felt so that we can step right into the shoes of Mary and see what it was like to stand there and watch your child be crucified for the saving of the world. It's going to be incredibly powerful. On Easter Sunday, like he said, we're going to all come together next door at uh, Tri-County at 1030. 1030, did I have that right? 10.30. It's going to be 10.30 now. And we're going to do it at 10.30? Well, see, here's the deal. If we did, here's my thought process. We always did church at 10.30 last year on the Easter service, but we've moved it to 10.15, and I didn't want to confuse people, but if they come 15 minutes early, good for them, right? It'll make my family on time. Ooh, did I just say that out loud? All right. Don't tell her I said that. That's her dad over there. All right. Anyway, I say all that to say um, that final week we're going to look at Jesus coming back and rising again because that's what Easter is all about. I have a really incredibly cool thing that's going to happen on that Sunday. I'm not going to tell you about it because it's just going to be really cool. Um, but this, this next five weeks ought to play out to be some really cool experiences um, as we look together at what Christ did for us in the in the uh, months leading up to, or the months, the days leading up to his death. If you got your Bibles, do me a favor, turn to the book of Luke. And we're going to be in chapter 22, and we're going to be in verse 14, and I want to kind of tell you what's happening, okay? As you are pulling up your Bible to Luke chapter 22, verse 14, I want to kind of give you some insight on what is going on, okay? There's a miracle that's going to happen just like any other miracle. You know, Jesus had gone out, he turned water into wine, he'd poured, you know, spit on some dirt, put mud in a boy's eyes or a man's eyes and helped him to see. He's cured leprosy. He's done all kinds of miracles in front of the disciples. And for the last three years, they have watched miracle after miracle after miracle happen. And it's kind of become a place where they would take it for granted and kind of become happenstance like, oh, it's just another Jesus thing. Here we go. And, And they were told, Hey guys, I want you to go and I want you to walk down this road and you're going to find a man and you need to tell him that we're going to come do Passover and he's going to look at you and go, oh, I've been expecting you. We, I have this room upstairs in my house and you can go up there and you can do Passover. And sure enough, they go down the street, they talk to this man and he says, I've been waiting for you. I have this room, it's upstairs, and you can come do Passover. And I can just imagine the disciples who've seen miracle after miracle after miracle happen go, yeah, that's Jesus again, here we go. And they don't think anything of it. But little do they know that they're walking into the last days they have with Jesus. Now, they're walking into what we call, and we've heard of called, the upper room before. Everybody heard that word, the upper room? It's like the room that's up above. That's why they call it the upper room. And, and they were going up, and they were going to have a Passover dinner. This is something that if you were a Jewish person, you would do every single year. It was Passover was a remembrance of the Exodus. If you don't know what the Exodus is, it's when Moses led the Israelites out from under Egyptian rule because they were slaves to him. Remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago. 
he would remove them out underneath the Egyptian rule. And Jesus, or God rather, did some amazing things to make that happen. And so every year they would have a meal called Passover in which they would celebrate what Christ had done. Okay? Now, so they all sit down, just like we're sitting down right now. And they serve the meal. Now, I'm going to serve you our meal. Ushers, go ahead and come on up. And you're going to hold it for a little bit longer today. Sorry about that. But it's to help you understand, okay, is to help you understand what they did and what they went through. So the guys are going to come up and they're going to, they're going to serve you while I explain to you how our meal is a little different than theirs. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. Good job. All right. Go ahead and serve, guys. Don't, don't stand. Go. All right. So... Our meal is a little bit different, and here's how. We have a cracker and we have grape juice, right? We do that because of convenience sake, okay? It's to remember the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. But a person who was involved in a... I'll take one. I have one? Thanks, buddy. It's easier to talk when you have a little bit of a... You know, I don't know what this is called. What is this called? A symbol. There we go. An example. All right, so we have the cracker and we have the, the juice, which represented the body and the blood. A Jewish family would sit down at Passover, and they'd have so much more than grape juice and a cracker. They would have what's called the Seder plate, okay? And the Seder plate would have everything from a hard-boiled egg, which represented the fact that the temple was destroyed and they could no longer take sacrifices to the temple. There was a shank bone of a lamb, which was a dried bone that just kind of sat on the plate, which had remembrance that their children were um, passed over, that, that, they were sacri- or that they were saved because of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. There's greens that present life. There's um, herbs that are bitter that make them realize how much pain and agony the people had to come through to get out. And all of this plate that they eat is a remembrance, okay? It's a remembrance of what Christ, or what God did, Jesus, same person, what he did when he led them out of Egyptian rule, okay? So when we take this, we are celebrating or we're reenacting as a part what it looks like to have Passover dinner, okay? This is so far from it, though. And what I wanted to do for you is I wanted to put you in that position. All right. Does everybody have what they need, or are we still going? We're still going. Okay. That's okay. I'll I'll, I'll explain to you more. We have one cup, okay? In a Seder dinner, they had four cups. One was they would drink it, and they would read praises out of the Bible. One is uh, they would remember. One, they would leave for Elijah because a true Jewish person doesn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, okay? So to even this day, they leave a cup for Elijah because Elijah's going to bring the, the forecoming of the new Messiah. And so if you're a Jewish person to this day, you leave a cup for Elijah so that, and, and, and at the end of every meal, the little ones, the little kids, they go to the door, they open it up, they see if Elijah's there, and if he's not, they shut the door and they go pour it out. Sounds crazy, but that's what Jewish people do. All right, so for us, all right, we know that Jesus is there. We don't have that. The third cup, all right, Elijah's cup is the fourth cup. The third cup is the cup of redemption, or, yeah, redemption, okay? That is the cup that Jesus held up when he said, hey, you know, this is my body, which is broken for you every time you, or my blood, rather, which was, which was spilled for you every time you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. All right, that was the third of the fourth of the four cups, all right? Now, Got all that in your mind? Did I just feed you with a fire hydrant? Sorry. Okay. Everybody served? Okay, awesome. What I want to do is I want to take you for a moment to exactly the place that they were. All right? So if you'll do me a favor, and I want you to close your eyes just for a moment, because I want to try and help you picture this the best that you can. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything. I really want you to think. Okay? You're sitting at a table with 11 of your closest friends that you spent the last three years doing life with, one of them being the Savior of the world named Jesus, who has done some amazing things in front of you. He reclines back at the table. You eat your plate, just like you have every year. And then he looks at you and he says these words. In the next couple days, I'm going to die. I'm going to die for you, but I'm going to die. Can you imagine what it would be like Let me give you a little bit of understanding of what that could be like. Imagine you sat down for Christmas dinner and your dad across the table looks at you and he says, this is the last day I'm going to be on earth, the last one of the three days that I'm going to be on earth. After we eat this, things are going to get crazy and I'm going to die. Imagine the feelings and the emotions that you would feel. Now imagine how those disciples were feeling. 
Now, let's take it one step further, okay? Then he starts looking at people, and he really brings the tension level up, and he goes, and there's somebody in this room that's going to betray me tonight. And you know what else? There's somebody in this room that thinks that he's got it all figured out, but he's going to deny me three times. And all of y'all, you all, I'm telling you that I'm dying and I'm going I'm to raise again for your salvation, but you're more concerned about who's the greatest in the room. And all of a sudden, can you imagine the tension that's swirling in that room? As Judas realizes that he's the one that betrayed him and he's starting to think, how can I end my life? As Peter, though he wants to stand up and be bold and say, I'll never deny you, Christ knows that he's the exact one. That if push came to shove, he couldn't stand up. And then there's this guy by the name of Thomas, who we're going to focus on today, okay? And Thomas is sitting there, and he's like, what in the world? I'm not even sure that God is real. And he is doubting God in one of the craziest, biggest moments of his life. He is sitting there in front of the Savior of the world who is going to come and is going to take away his sins. And, and, and he's explaining it to Thomas, and Thomas is sitting there right in his presence and going, I don't even know if I believe this. And in the midst of that, Jesus held up the, crack, or held up the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Every time you eat this, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. You can do it now. And he took the juice or the wine at the time and he said, and this is my blood which was spilt for you. And every time you're together and you drink it, I want you to do it in remembrance of me. And they drank it. And here's what happened. I want you to see this picture, right? The tension in the room is just huge. You can open your eyes now. The tension in the room is just huge. Peter's trying to figure out, how am I going to get through this moment? You got Judas over here going, I just went out of the room. You got Thomas who's sitting here going, man, I have followed this guy for three years and he doesn't even care about the fact that, that I'm his child. Why would, he, why would he lie to me? Why would, that's food that just came out of my mouth. <laughs> little, little note to self, don't eat the communion when you're preaching. It's embarrassing but I'm okay with it. So, so here's what happened. He's looking at Thomas, and Thomas is looking back and going, man, I don't even know that I believe this is true. Have I lived a life for the last three years of my life? And, and what I want you to notice about this is exactly like us, right? It's exactly like you, and it's exactly like me. Do me wait, one favor real quick. Go back to closing your eyes. Do you remember a time in your life when God asked you to do something incredibly huge and to trust him. And you said, God, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can believe. I don't know, God, that, that I can come through. I, I don't know that I can trust that you are who you are. Maybe he asked you to take a job and to step out and you went, oh, I don't know, God. How do I know you're real? Maybe he asked you to give more than you normally give and you're like, God, I don't have any money. How am I supposed to do that? And he's like, trust me. Maybe he's asking you to do something in your marriage or in your life, and you're going, God, I just don't know. I have doubts. You ever been there? With your eyes closed, I want you to think about this. What did Thomas miss out on sitting at that table by refusing to believe? What did he lose? Think about it for a second. He could have embraced the moment. He could have just leaned right into God. He could have, he could have just, man, I just want to, I want to soak up every moment with you, Jesus. But his heart had turned completely away from God and said, if this is what this is all about, I'm out. And he missed one of the hugest moments in history with Christ. And what I want to get you to understand is you don't have to miss the moment too. They remembered in their traditions how centuries ago in the homes of the enslaved, a perfect, spotless lamb was killed. Its bones left unbroken. Its blood, the only thing required to turn away death. You see, these young men, they'd been through all the motions before. Even since they'd met Jesus and life became altogether unpredictable, Passover was still the same. Except this time. 
This time, Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, the shouts of Hosanna. This time, Jesus would cry. This time, he would wash the feet of his disciples. This time, there were 30 pieces of silver sitting heavily in Judas's pocket. This time, Jesus would sit down at the table. He would take the traditional unleavened bread, and he would break it, and he would say, this is my body. And he would take the cup. This is my blood. This time, Peter heard and rejected that he would deny knowing Christ three times. This time, Jesus told them again he was going to die. You see, they'd seen him feed thousands. They'd seen him calm a storm. They'd seen him heal the sick, the blind, the paralyzed, the possessed. Just recently, he told a four days dead corpse to come forth out of a tomb and out walked Lazarus still covered in burial cloths. What could slay a man like that? It bothered them. It filled them with sorrow just thinking about it. Jesus, Jesus though, he reassured them. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. But Thomas, <laughs> Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? You know Thomas, doubting Thomas. Here he is, true to form again, right? Always questioning, always doubting, always missing out on something. I don't know that that's his whole story, though. You know, people tend to forget that when Jesus came upon a potentially deadly situation in Judea a while back, it was Thomas who turned to the other men and said, let's go, that we may die with him. See, Thomas was brave. Thomas loved Jesus, but what Thomas was lacking was an understanding of who Jesus actually is. He's sitting at a table with all the evidence around him pointing to a Messiah, the Messiah, the perfect spotless lamb foreshadowed by the Passover, and he missed the point. He didn't understand who he was actually sitting next to. He couldn't conceive what was about to happen, and he didn't hear that this is not the end. So that's why when Jesus was arrested, Thomas ran. When Jesus was killed, Thomas broke. And when Jesus rose from the grave and appeared to the disciples that first time, Thomas wasn't even there. You know, we call him Doubting Thomas, but I'm wondering if nearsighted Thomas might not be a little bit more accurate. You see, much like most of us, Thomas just, just couldn't see the bigger picture. His vision of who his best friend and teacher was at the Passover table was clouded by his understanding of what he could actually see. So when the world met them in the garden that night and he lost sight of the Lord, Thomas wrongly believed that the world had won. What will be left when I've drawn my last breath? Besides the folks I've met and the folks who know me. Will I discover a soul-saving love? Or just the dirt above and below me? I'm a doubting Thomas I took a promise But I do not feel safe Oh, me of little faith Sometimes I pray for a slap in the face 
then I beg to be spared because I'm a coward if there's a master of death I bet he's holding his breath as I show the blind and tell the deaf about his power I'm a doubting Thomas I can't keep my promises Cause I don't know what's safe Oh, me of little faith Please Give me time to decipher the signs Please forgive me for the time that I've wasted I'm a doubting Thomas I'll take your promise I know nothing to say Oh, me of little faith. Oh, me of little faith. Oh, me of little faith. And sometimes we're all with doubting Thomas, aren't we? God asks us to do something and to trust him, to follow him, to, to just sit in the presence of his ways and we go, but God, I just don't know that I can trust you. I, I don't know that I have the faith to walk with you right now. God, what you're asking me, man, when, when, it's, when, it's, when it's joyful and when we're singing songs and our hands are raised and everybody's in the room and there's all this energy, God, it's so easy to follow you, but then I walk out on my own and you ask me to do something that's bigger than me and I'm not sure that I can. And some of you that sit in this room right now, that's you right there. You're in the very essence of that moment. You see, for some of you that are sitting in this room, a long time ago, Christ said, hey, I want you to make me savior of your life. And you're going, I just don't know that I can. I mean, to, to get baptized in front of people or to follow you or to tell people that I'm a follower of you. Man, I just don't know that I'm ready for that moment. I don't know that I can have the faith that you're gonna be there to carry me if I fall. So God, I'll come and I'll sing your songs and, and I'll get in the crowd and I'll, I'll raise my hand at the right moments, God, but I just don't know that I can follow you with my complete and whole heart. Some of you, you sit right there and you've been sitting there not for months, not for days, but for years. And can I tell you something? God still loves you. God understands you. God knows where you are. Because in the midst of Thomas' moment, when he was at the table and he was questioning God, and then he was walking away, God was planning all the while how he was going to rope Thomas in, how he was going to help Thomas understand who he was, how he was going to give faith to a Thomas that had zero faith at all. And I say all that to say this. Over these next five weeks, those of you that are sitting in this room right now and you have doubted and wondered, is this God that I think about, that I, that I talk about following, is he real? Some of you today, you just need to quit being Doubting Thomas. You need to stop. You need to take these next five weeks and just immerse yourself in God. Just learn exactly what the Passover was about. Learn exactly what Jesus did as he walked that road to Golgotha and he died on that cross and he rose again for your sins so that you could have eternal life. You need to, to pray and to talk to him. You need to have conversations with people who understand him, who have a relationship with him. You need to dive completely in because here's the difference between that and Thomas. Thomas, when he got scared, stepped back. And my challenge to you over the next five weeks is as you get scared, dive more. Dive more. But if you're still scared, here's what I would say about God. It's in John. I want to read it to you. I'll tell you where to go here in just a second see if I find it. John chapter 20, verse 24. It'll be up on the screen. Jesus is resurrected from the dead now. And it says this, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called 
the twin was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, man, we've seen God. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, the place my finger in, and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe, guys, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to be tricked again. I am doubting Thomas, remember? And eight days later, his disciples were again together inside and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus started being Jesus again. And the Bible says this, that although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood with them and said, peace be with you. And then he walks over to Thomas, the Bible says. And he says, Thomas, feel my hands. Go ahead, just touch them. Feel my scars. Run your hand over every single one of them. And then he said the, the most believable one. He goes, go ahead, put your hand in my side. Can you imagine being Thomas? As he put his hand in the side of God, and he went, crud, I sat right there at the table, and I missed the biggest part. Why didn't I trust him? I was right there. And I could just see Thomas fall to his knees and grab the ankles of Jesus and say, I'm so sorry. Sorry that I didn't have the faith to believe. Sorry that I didn't have the courage to stand and to follow you into your darkest moments. Oh, I'm so sorry. And Christ being who Christ is, picks him up and says, it's okay. And I love you. And you're mine. And then he looks at him and he says, now, go believe. These next five weeks, if you're having a hard time trusting God, if you're having a hard time believing this whole faith thing, then here's my challenge to you. Start praying, hey God, I wanna put my fingers in the sores of your hands, in the, in the wounds in your hands. God, I wanna put my hand in your side. I want you to reveal yourself to me, God, so plainly, so bluntly that an idiot could get it because I need that. And just start asking God that. God, I need to see, the, I need to see you in a way that I've never seen you before because I'm having such a hard time believing. And I guarantee you because I know how real God is. That at the end of this five weeks, he'll have you on your knees, wrapping your arms around his feet, saying, I'm so sorry. I never understood, but now I do. Would you do me a favor? Will you bow your head and close your eyes just one more time? It seems a little redundant. But as you're sitting there with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're sitting in this room right now and you're going, Matt, I am one of those people. I, I doubt God so much. I, I, I just, I, I'm doubting Thomas. I am the guy who, or the lady who just, man, I just, I just can't have faith. I just, I, I want to walk with God. I, I come because I, I know it helps me, but, but I haven't had the faith to say, God, you can have my life. And I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to do that. Just lift your hand up. Man, I, I need to give my life to Christ, okay? All right. Anybody else? Okay. If you lifted your hand, will you just look at me for a second? Just, you just have to make eye contact. Everybody else's heads are bowed. I want to pray with you that in the next five weeks, I mean, I'll sit down and talk with you about what it means to know Christ, okay? But man, my prayer is that in the next five weeks, he shows himself to you in a way that you could never doubt. Start asking him of that. Say, hey, God, I need you to reveal yourself to me. I want to believe. I just need some faith right now. God's faithful. He'll give you faith. That's who he is. I'm going to find some people who will sit down and talk with you. Is that okay? Either I'll do it myself or, or I'll find a gentleman or a lady that will sit down and talk with you. I, I need you to do me a favor. Right over there on that wall next to the exit door is a little visitor card. Will you just grab it and write your name and your phone number? And I will connect with you this week and we'll sit down and we'll talk about what it means to know Christ. All right? Let me pray for you. Jesus, I just pray that you would put faith in these people's lives like they've never had it before. That God, you would just ring so loud and so clear in their ears that God, they would just know that Father, you're real. And that Father, they can have faith in you. And that God, when their faith becomes real in you, God, their walk, their life, their joy will jump meteorically. 
because they don't know how great life can be with you, God. Father, help me as their pastor to help them understand who you are in a very real way. Help them to understand what a relationship looks like. And God, may we just give you glory for who you are. May this be the most incredible five weeks of all of our lives as we sit and we remember, as we eat the supper, we stand in the feet of Mary, we pick up the cross like Simon, and we see what it was like for you to walk that road to die for our sins. God, I ask these things in your name.